Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm very uh, happy to welcome you on behalf of the Academy to our first session this morning. Um, as Professor Su Susan Peterson said yesterday in the opening remarks uh, during her lecture, uh, we are trying at this conference to not exactly recreate, but reimagine the issues, problems, decisions made during the time of the Balfour Declaration. Because the issues which were raised by the Balfour Declaration are still contentious issues today in the political discourse in the Middle East and in Israel itself. And it is sometimes very easy to read back our present perceptions to what happened in 1917. And it is not easy to extricate oneself from that, but we are trying to do it. Uh, yesterday it was mentioned, of course, that the Balfour Declaration was part of a British, French, Allied um, set of decisions which were, and plans which were made during the war. Uh, Sykes-Picot was mentioned. I'm not sure the McMahon letter was mentioned. We know that uh, the British and the French governments uh, during the war against the uh, Ottoman Empire and its allies uh, have reached, together with Russia, uh, and coordinating with Russia, and in a way also Italy, some decisions about the future disposition uh, of the Levant. And it is important for us today to realize that during World War I, at that time, it was considered to be part of the international political climate that those who win a war are able more or less to impose uh, conditions on those who lose the war. And um, territories which are occupied during a war can be annexed or disposed according to the will of the, those who win the war. And this was not mentioned yesterday, and usually it is not mentioned uh, in the discourse about the Balfour Declaration of sykes picot that World War I broke out only a year and a half, less even, uh, after two Balkan wars, the First War and the Second War. And in both cases, the victors very clearly annexed territories uh, got in, involved in what today would be called almost genocidal and certainly ethnic cleansing policies. Uh, the fact that a city like uh, Thessaloniki, Salonika, Solun, uh, is today part of Greece and not part of Turkey and not part of Bulgaria is not because the majority of the people in 1914 were Greeks, they were not, uh, but because in the Second um, Balkan War, uh, after the, the various Greek Orthodox nations won the first war, they started fighting against each other. The Greeks, the Mont Montenegrins, the Serbs, against Bulgaria, and they won. And therefore, Salonika, Thessaloniki is today part of Greece. So it is very difficult to us to put ourselves back in the situation which was considered to be normal diplomatic and political process. Uh, at the time of World War I and the various dispositions during the war and after the war and the peace treaty first, the peace treaty of Sever, which was never carried out, and later Lausanne, and of course in between the decision at San Remo, uh, decided uh, to impose a peace which was a peace of the conquerors, the peace of the winners. And the Balfour Declaration, like sykes because like the existence of entities like Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, were not an outcome of the political decision of the people in the area, but were imposed by the Brits and the French according to the imperial interest. And it's very important to realize this today because today the international norms and the moral considerations are very different. Uh, we are very happy to have here um, uh, an academic from Istanbul because again, a part of the discourse internationally and also locally about the Balfour Declaration, as well as sykes become usually looks at the discussion within the Jewish community, 
within the Arab or Palestinian community, uh, deals with uh, policies which Germany tried to develop during the war and to which the Balfour Declaration, in a way, was some sort of response. And there has been very little, certainly, here, a discussion about the uh, way in which the Ottoman Empire, which controlled practically all of uh, Palestine and the Levant at the time of the Balfour Declaration, responded to a British declaration which was made public, which didn't clearly say that the area will be under British rule, but the implication was obviously there, of territory which was part of the Ottoman Empire. And let me welcome also the representative of the Turkish Embassy here. I'm very glad that, um, that you're here uh, on behalf of the Turkish Embassy, because Israel is a successor of a lot of things, of the British Empire, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in terms of its population of the Russian and Soviet Empire. We're also a successor state of the Ottoman Empire, so we're very glad uh, to hear have a representative of the Turkish Embassy. Uh, our first speaker, who's going to discuss the Turkish response, is Professor Soli Özel, uh, who teaches at Kadir Has University in Istanbul. Before that, he taught at Bilgi University. He has studied in the United States, is a graduate of SAIS, John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies, is both an academic and a public intellectual. I'm sure that many of you who read the New York Times, for example, uh, in which uh, there are reports about what's happening in Turkey today, occasionally will find his name as a commentator. He's, co he's a commentator for Turkish periodicals, newspaper, TV, and also very much in the West. And I'd like to welcome you very much here in Jerusalem. Soli, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, glad to be here. And I've been in Jerusalem before, but I think I've never really had a rainy day. Uh, so that's, that's fine. Um, I'm not usually into doing uh, slide presentations, but um, my colleagues and I, and I have to say that this uh, work has been done, or it's the beginnings of the work with, by, with my colleagues, Ayhan Akhtar at Istanbul Bilgi University, a doctoral candidate, Ozan Kuyumcuoğlu, also at Bilgi University. Uh, Ozan especially was uh, very important for us because he reads Ottoman and he's been through the archives. And Ayhan knows the um, period uh, under scrutiny very well. And we sat down to figure out exactly what happened. And we had some restrictions because Ottoman archives, Ottoman government archives were not really open uh, for this kind of research. Uh, maybe not, uh, and therefore, we had to rely on both outside sources some secondary books that are that have now become classics, such as Isaiah Friedman's books, and then uh, we relied mainly on um, the press. And I'll get to the conclusions in in a moment, but let me uh, let me start. 1917 is really the l'année terrible for the Ottoman war effort. Nearly the entire eastern part of Anatolia was under Russian occupation. It's interesting, we don't hear much about that in our history classes. Um, there were two unsuccessful attacks earlier to Suez Canal that weakened the troops on the Palestinian front. The Arab Revolt of June 1916 came as a big surprise, uh, and then loss of Mecca uh, was registered. Uh, but. Uh, the authorities decided that even if Mecca was gone, they were going to continue stubbornly, even if it was futile, to defend Medina. And that, of course, jeopardized the defenses of the Syrian front. The British army <coughs> recaptured Baghdad and Kut in the spring of 1917. The Kut especially was a major Ottoman wartime success back in 1916. And as a result, in, in, in response to, uh, to the kind of threats that they were feeling under, uh, the Ottoman authorities have formed the Yildirim Thunderbolt Army Group, 
under, with, along with their allies, the Germans, of course, under the command of Marshal von Falkenheim in July of 1917. So this is really the general picture prior to uh, the British attack at the end of October. And this is the map of the Ottoman Russian front at the end of 1917. And I'm stressing the Russian invasion, the, the territories that the Russians have occupied and all that, because in the response of the Ottomans to the Balfour Declaration, the Russian element is a very important one. Sorry. Yeah. The map isn't showing oh. over here. No, I have to change it. Right. Okay. Oh. <coughs> you know, uh, today is November 2, 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. Five days from now will be the 100th anniversary of the storming of the Winter Palace and basically passing of power to the Bolsheviks in Russia. And given the fact that the Bol and I'll get to that, the, given the fact that the Bolsheviks' main promise was to get out of the war as soon as possible, you can understand that in such a tight corner, the Ottomans paid far more attention to the Bolshevik coming to power than whatever the Balfour Declaration may have actually implied for them. <coughs> These are, okay, this is the cast of characters. Um, this is Mustafa Kemal, which is at the time uh, part of the uh, Thunderbolt army grouping. This is Enver, in my judgment, a man with incredible ambitions in reverse relation to his capacities. <laughs> This is Jemal that is probably, who's probably more familiar uh, to you as well from your own history. And they meet actually in Aleppo to decide what they're going to do. And as the uh, ranking Turkish of Ottoman official, officer, Mustafa Kemal proposes the following. That the Ottomans should pur pursue a purely defensive strategy. This is from a report that he has written on the 20th of uh, September after the, uh, after the meeting in Aleppo, that they should recall every soldier that was sent abroad and they should concentrate on the Sinai front. His proposed defense line would be just to the south of Jerusalem and naturally it would have excluded holy cities of Mecca and Medina. In plain words, what Kemal suggested was, let us not waste our resources, let us not allow our troops to be slaughtered in Medina, which is really a futile effort. Let's withdraw them, let's concentrate them in this front, and then we will have a fighting chance against the British. Um, and that was the consensus in Aleppo. The Germans thought the same way as well. But then Enver went to Istanbul and uh, decided that Medina was too important to drop. Uh, they, he would not take the political risk of abandoning the holy city. So they still, since they still considered themselves as the army of the caliphate, and therefore they made a very futile mistake, a very critical mistake in terms of the Ottomans' war strategy. <coughs> if you look at the uh, following map, You see, this is where the Brits were going to be after Jerusalem is taken. And to the north, uh, the, there were the Ottoman defenses. So they believed that even after Jerusalem fell in December, they really did have a fighting chance to win back those territories. But most importantly, they counted on the Germans to win the war. Again, that relates, and that's the next thing, that relates to uh, the Bolshevik takeover. As I said earlier, the Bolshevik revolution overshadows the Balfour Declaration. The top brass think that if the Russians exit the stage, Germans would be the winners. Uh, 
I mean, in the full paper, we will use an anecdote by a young Ottoman officer at the time uh, who, count, who recounts or who recalls that a few days after the Bolshevik takeover and then the, 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 um, a few days after the decision to withdraw from the war, the Russians on the other side of the line come up with uh, uh, a, white, a piece of white cloth to basically surrender, not surrender, but to basically say they're not going to be fighting anymore, and the two, the two sides actually celebrate together. Uh, Shevke Sureya Aydemir, who later became a communist himself and went to Moscow with our celebrated poet uh, Nazim Hikmet, uh, recalls this uh, instance in, in, his, in his memoirs. In November, <laughs> There really is no official Ottoman government reaction to the Balfour Declaration. There is one reaction, and that comes in Vienna, and I will quote in a moment uh, uh, at length from that, from that report by the, by the ambassador in Vienna. So in the absence of official documents uh, uh, that are not disclosed, we surmise, this, we surmise that there was no official uh, reaction from the silence of the Ottoman press at the time, given the fact that there was wartime censorship and everything that was printed in, in the papers were actually controlled. The fact that there was no mention even of, of the Balfour Declaration suggests that they didn't, either they didn't take it very seriously or they didn't want to respond to what, what, it, actually, what it actually meant. But there is a reaction, as I said, in Istanbul. If there is no reaction in Istanbul, the Ottoman ambassador in Vienna fires a warning shot, and I guess that is not uh, a surprise. The, uh, the Germans, again, we see this in the really unsurpassed book by Isaiah Friedman, that the Germans are really concerned by the appropriation of the Zionists caused by the British. I mean, even I even the concept of a homeland for the Jews was a German concept that the, that the British used. And suddenly, alarm bells are ringing in Germany and other, perhaps, in, uh, and, their, and their partner uh, countries that they have given an incredible uh, trump card to the British by letting them actually be the sponsor of the Zionists in, in Palestine. So, there is a, therefore, as soon as the uh, declaration is known, the Germans put an inordinate amount of pressure on the Ottomans to actually respond, to relent, and acknowledge the right of immigration and economic activities to Jews in all parts of the Ottoman Empire. They also ask that the uh, right to free immigration to Palestine and some degree of cultural autonomy be granted to the Jews. Uh, in fact, uh, in December of 1917, uh, Talat, uh, the, the Vezir Azam, or the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire at the time, uh, is in uh, Berlin and he is supposed to meet with Dr. Julius Becker to give him an, uh, an interview on the 12th of December, which will be published on the last day of the year, on the 31st of December. Talat, those of you who may know, is a uh, no-nonsense man, and for the Armenians, not necessarily a very likable man, um, calls the Balfour Declaration a joke, a blag. Um, but he has to bow to increasing and intensifying pressures by the Germans. Therefore, in the interview, he does say certain things that people hang, uh, hang on to. Uh, by the way, Jemal, who was responsible, of course, uh, for Jerusalem and for, for Palestine, in the last few months prior to the Balfour Declaration, is uh, incarcerating a lot of Jews. His, uh, the Ottoman representative, the Kaimakam, is actually fairly brutal. There is fear of a mass expulsion, uh, like the ones the, uh, to, of, the, of the Armenians. Talat intervenes and actually uh, quiets things down and much of the authority of Jemal is really taken away from him by the time we have the, declaration, the Balfour Declaration. 
In fact, von Falkenheim as well, when he arrives, his presence also makes a difference. Talat's answers in his interview with Becker, with Dr. Becker, is usually considered an Ottoman Balfour declaration. But it really is nothing of the sort. He is actually very circumspect, circumspect and does not go further than promising rights to the Jews that would be granted by the new regions law that they were about to enact in the, in the parliament, he says. But it's the Ottoman ambassador in Vienna who actually encapsulates probably the official view of what the Balfour Declaration actually means for the war effort and for the Ottomans. Uh, the Ottoman ambassador in Vienna at the time is one Hussein Hilmi Pasha, who at one point served as the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, he is someone with a much broader perspective of things and probably a much better strategic sense of things than just any, any ambassador. And in a note that, that he sends on the 13th of November 1917 to the then Foreign Minister of the Ottoman Empire, Ahmed Nesimi, he says the following. Forming an independent government in Palestine to be administered by the Jews was the promise of the US president to the Zionists. And the British government supports this. These reports were also discussed in the secretly held meetings of the Zionist Committee in Vienna. In addition to this, the Zionists discussed the matter and asked the assistance of Austro-Hungarian and German governments. These are, by the way, from the Ottoman documents, Palestine in the Ottoman documents uh, in Istanbul, available online as well. Though the Ottoman ambassador in Vienna continues, British Foreign Secretary Balfour's letter to Lord Rothschild, dated 2 November 1917, which was quoted nearly in all the national presses in Europe, proves that England has seriously decided to form an Israeli government in the above-mentioned lands. He does say, Hukumeti Israelia. If the British forces enter Jerusalem, the Palestinian question would become very detrimental for the sublime port. And as I have mentioned before, he continues, we should do everything possible to repel or at least to stop the enemy with all our capacity. <clears throat> then, uh, about three months, uh, three months later, comes the uh, assessment by the uh, ambassador, by the Ottoman ambassador in Bern, Fuad Selim Bey. Again, Bern is, is a place where, Bern in Switzerland was a place of great Zionist activity. And his dispatch on 20 February 1920 is, and this is, remember, prior to the German assault in the spring, recently German and Swiss Zionists and some journalists applied to me and asked about the Ottoman government's position in relation to the occupation of Palestine and Zionism. But, and, and that proves the earlier point that I made. I have not received an instruction on this matter until now. We're talking about three and a half months after the Balfour Declaration, and the ambassador in Bern says he has received no official uh, instructions on the matter of the Balfour Declaration from the Sublime Port. Um, and therefore, I do not have any instructions on the Ottoman government's policy in relation to this issue. Apart from the Grand Vizier's declaration in Berlin, the said uh, interview on this matter, I have nothing to add. Therefore, I abstain from making any comments on this matter. He continues, while the question of Zionism is occupying the minds of European politicians and it is at the same time widely covered by the world press, I reckon that our government is behaving extremely cautiously by keeping dead silent on this matter. However, I reckon this state of silence is also contradicting the Ottoman war aims. And the final warning by him to the Minister of Foreign Affairs is the following. Any minor favor granted only to the Jews would cause great remorse in the Islamic world, especially those Ottoman Arabs who consider Palestine as their fatherland and the inherited property of Islam. The new privileges that the British are granting to Jews would be deemed disagreeable even by the Christian communities in the Holy Land. 
and we've heard that yesterday uh, in the presentation as well. Apart from these, it should be taken into account that not all Jews share Zionist opinions and aspirations. It's very interesting that in almost all communications, including Talat's interviews, there is great care about distant or differentiating between Jews and Zionists and how the historically relations between the Ottomans and the Jews had actually been good. And that's, all of them say the same thing. So the essence of the Ottoman response, till the very end of its existence, the Ottoman state refuses to accommodate the nationalist demands of the Zionist cause. Even after the German Kaiserschlacht ends in defeat, and the hope of ever gaining back the lost territory of Palestine and Syria, Talat's negotiations with the Zionists do not deliver what they want. Again, I may not have stressed it, the importance of the Bolshevik withdrawal from the war is that with Russia out of the war, the Ottomans are almost certain that the Germans will win the war. And if the Germans win the war, then all of this is basically an academic discussion. Palestine is going to revert back to the Ottomans. Until the very end, they do not lose that hope, but then once defeat is certain, obviously these lands are not going to be taken back. Only once on August 11, 1918, does Talat acquiesce to the demand to use the term uh, national and religious Jewish center in Palestine. This is an there's an incredible amount of pressure on him by Mr. Perlmutter, who meets with him. Can't remember his first name now. Um, uh, to actually recognize national and religious national and religious Jewish center, he refuses it. He once says it, and it is in the notes that Perlmutter sends to his superiors. But the next day, uh, Talat withdraws the term national and restricts his comment to religious rights of the Jews. That may be a few hours worth of recognizing national uh, Jewish center is then considered the Ottoman Balfour Declaration. It is also interesting and intriguing, you know, that the war for all practical purposes is over. The Ottomans are running for their lives. The, the British and the Arabs are on their way to Damascus. And in August of 1917, the Zionists are still trying to get the approval of Talat in order to legitimize the project in there. That's, that's pretty significant in my judgment. That is, perhaps it suggests the uncertainty that maybe the winners are not going to be able to impose their will totally after, after the war. Conclusion. The Balfour Declaration did not lead to a strategic response on the part of the Ottomans. They did not change their war plans because of it. They were too busy dealing with the Arab revolts and trying to protect the Palestinian front after the Third Battle of Gaza. The Ottoman press remained silent in the wake of the declaration. The Ottoman government had to bow to pressures by the German Empire that panicked over this development. The former Grand Vizier and then Ambassador in Vienna, Hussein Hilmi, and the Ambassador in Bern, where Zionists were very active, accurately interpreted the significance of the declaration for the future. By the way we, he handled the matter under German pressure, so did Talat. The Unionists expected the Germans to win the war and played for time on this matter. Even once the war was decisively lost, Talad and his government stuck to the line that the Ottomans held since the time of Abdul Hamid II, when Zionist settlements began and objected to an independent or sovereign Jewish political presence in Palestine. So there is an incredible degree of consistency from 1897 onwards. No matter who comes to power in the Ottoman Empire, that their uh, willingness to allow the Jews to migrate is dependent on the Jews accepting Ottoman citizenship and that it should not go beyond a cultural or social presence that will be strictly under <coughs> Ottoman sovereignty. 
And that line is held, as I said, even after the game for the Ottomans was long over. Thank you.